is this? I don't know. It's me. It's Amid the Ruins. It's a guy who makes dire wave music. <laughs> it's Amid the Ruins. Dire way dire music. Wave. music. What I've talked about in, you know, probably a hundred articles of Jay's analysis is the implementation of the AI smart grid in the giant smart cities, which is what IBM talks about publicly building. And that's where we're going, and that's what I think we have to be really concerned about. So all of these tensions, they are part of a long-term strategy to basically get everybody moved into mega cities. Uh, they'll be forced to, they'll be forced off of land and so forth for environmental reasons, and basically concocted and invented environmental nonsense. Uh, then you'll be stuck in some hellhole mega city in a, you know, basically a carton-sized apartment living over a Target or something, or inside of a Target or a Walmart, as I said <laughs> several years ago. It's actually coming true now. There's actually Target cities. This is all part of the long-term globalist strategy. So, but to get there, you've got to have the constant clash, the constant um, alchemical blending and mixing and smashing together right out of Manichaeanism to produce the convergence, to produce the synthesis. And that's what's crucial in all this and what is absolutely true from an alchemical, esoteric, philosophical, and geopolitical perspective, the fact the ruling elite seek to be post-human. Jasonalysis.com. can't try to fix 
affects today's problems politically. And this is what so many people in alt circles and alt right and alt whatever and alt media, they all seem to think that there's like a political solution to man's problems. And really the, the, the whole of modernity is built on this neo-pagan concept of political salvation. And there is no political salvation for man because man's problems are not essentially political. Uh, they're spiritual. that actually discussed how to invert and subvert that, changing images of man, things like this. So what has to happen is that, that the, the inversion has to be reverted back to the way it needs to be. And that means that first and foremost for man, it is spiritual issues. Those come first. Then we have the things like the philosophy and, and the family and the social issues and things like that. That comes next. And race or ethnicity can be classed as part of that. That is, in other words, you caring for your people is just a broader extension of the family, the tribe, the nation. All right, welcome everybody. Uh, this is a different kind of stream we're going to do today. Thank you for that, Philip. Yeah, let me fix that alert box. Somebody talked about that last time. It doesn't show up. Got to make sure our little zombies show up. <clears throat> and uh, I look like garbage because it's allergy season here, baby. The trees... The trees around here are vomiting up all of their damn spores. And so, if you know about Native American mythology, they have a creature called Pollen Boy. He's one of the spirits. And I'm starting to think Pollen Boy, Pollen Boy is a real demon. And I can assure you that Pollen Boy is after your boy right here. Because uh, I look like I've been, I look like I've been uh, playing video games all night in Mama's basement, sucking down damn Totino's pizza rolls through a straw. But you know what? I have not. I've not been in Mama's basement playing video games. Okay, well maybe I was in Mama's basement, but I went to bed strictly at the time that mama said go to bed which was at 11 p.m so i did not stay up all night in mama basement playing video games i was a good boy and went to bed when i was supposed to but i still got attacked even though i was being a good boy not misbehaving no sass mouth and i still got attacked by pollen boy native american demon and he's still making me look like i've been crying <laughs> I've been crying all night. I've been crying all night because I'm scared of Michael Lofton and Eric Ibarra. I'm just kidding. <coughs> oh, my allergies are going crazy, baby. Anyway, so we're going to talk about this lesser known book that's actually overlooked. Uh, this is a good book. And. It was one of the first books I read that was a significant critique of the papacy. I read it many years ago, maybe in about 2007, that looked at it from another angle, right? Because so many of these debates, as I said in the show description, they center around ancient texts and claims. Now, to a degree, that's unavoidable. That's going to be part of the dispute because this is a historic religion. And so in the Disputes between Protestants and Orthodox and Catholics, Roman Catholics, there's going to obviously be questions of forgeries, questions of authenticity, questions of 
nuance, uh, questions of ancient canons, etc., etc., Bible verses. But what is never covered, almost never, uh, I've never heard this covered until I read Orthodox works, the philosophy of the papacy, the metaphysics of the papacy. And yes, Dr. Philip Sherrard has an entire excellent little 115-page book on this. And unfortunately, I can't recommend everything that Dr. Sherrard uh, wrote. Towards the end of his life, he kind of drifted into perennialism. Um, but that's not to say that he doesn't have some good works. Uh, Greek, East, Latin, West is a really good work analyzing the philosophy of the two Um churches east and west or at least the so-called papal so-called church that so-called church that so-called roman catholic church um so greek east latin west is definitely worth reading for an, just an overview of the issues but I, i'm really i was really impressed with the philosophical theology critique that dr sherard gave so we're going to uh, do that today, and and as I said, I think that another thing that this is going to illustrate is that the level of critique that you see Ubi Petrus doing, the level of critique that you see me doing, the level of critique that you see uh, Snack, David, you know, the, the ortho bros in our circle doing, it's so much deeper, right? It's, it's so much more uh, authentic and multi-layered than just kind of this pop approach in this really low IQ, low tier approach that people like Matt Fred do where literally Matt Fred had a whole stream the other day where he just read Aquinas's response on the filioque. Like he just read the whole thing for 45 minutes as if that's really going to do anything as if there haven't been centuries of debate since Aquinas as if, Right. I mean, everybody knows Aquinas relied on forgeries of the Eastern Fathers. It's universally admitted. I mean, Frad doesn't even tell you any of this because Frad doesn't even know this stuff. OK, so I mean, Frad, Matt Frad is literally having on like Scott Hahn, you know, people that are like tier one pop apologists. So there's always going to be a big market for that level one tier one pop apologetic. And then what happens is that when people get into the Roman Catholic world, then they find out that it's not the honeymoon they thought it was. Then they've got to deal with Pachamama. Then they got to deal with Vatican II and, you know, basically figure out the next 10 years of mental gymnastics to make this just ridiculous system work. And the solution to this problem from our vantage point and from my vantage point, having looked at this for so many, many years, is that you can't solve this problem by this or that text. And that may sound strange because, well, couldn't we just find one verse or couldn't we just find a, a, a pronouncement in a council that will just settle the issue for everybody? Not really, uh, because we find out that there's no text that comes as a brute fact, right? There's no text that comes to us that's not theory laden, that's not part of an interpretive framework or matrix. So we have to utilize our paradigms for interpreting the evidence. And even if the Roman Catholics don't realize this because of their classical foundationalism, it's still the case. In fact, uh, Yasi, one of the reason and theology minions the other day was telling me that we don't just look at Vatican I's text, they have to be interpreted within a framework. And so we look to the fallible interpretation of Bishop Gasser to understand Vatican I's infallible interpretation but that's also fallible right your interpretation of bishop bishop gasser who's fallible's interpretation of vatican one which is supposed to be infallible it's just this never-ending circle of chain of nonsense right of a p and the point is that it's missing <clears throat> the epistemic question which is that there's a difference between there's a difference between knowing something with certitude in an existential sense and uh, objective public criteria for how we um, make appeals and how we adjudicate true and false, right? Because the papacy is not going to give you any better epistemic starting point than any other position. <laughs> really, literally, the Roman Catholic, the individual Roman Catholic, as we've said many, many times, is in no better epistemic position than an, a Protestant or an Orthodox. Because you still have to interpret 
Vatican II. You still have to figure out what uh, Denzinger and what these uh, gigantic papal documents are talking about. And so you don't resolve the dilemma by saying, well, we, we have an infallible head and an infallible rule. And uh, by the way, we don't actually know what the list of the infallible documents is. No Roman Catholic can tell you that. And when I mentioned that in uh, Lofton the other day, a couple weeks ago, replied on Twitter, just totally bypasses the epistemic question, right? right? Just just ignores it, right? Because they don't know anything about epistemology. They don't know the basics of epistemology. And the only go- goon in their squad, that Timothy Gordon guy, uh, when I approached him to discuss this, he sends me fart memes, right? So I don't, nobody's going to take that guy seriously. <laughs> right? He's like, I'm writing my PhD on Aristotle. Here's a fart meme, by the way. Just literally just a total douchebag. So I can't see why anybody would take these people seriously. Um, and yes, I, I'm thinking about just reviewing that whole debate. Uh, of course, I don't trust Matt Frad to not try to flag my channel. That's, the I think, the kind of underhanded things that these guys do. See, a lot of people don't know the underhanded things that these people do in the background. Not particularly Matt, Matt Frad, but uh, people like Lofton and Ibarra. I mean, they put on this front of being like really friendly and all that. And it's just a facade uh, when they do this really underhanded stuff behind the scenes. They tattletale. They go try to get people in trouble. It's just, it's just ridiculous and... I mean, that's why I don't want anything to do with any of those people. Um, they don't, they just consistently do this. And so we make a meme and make fun of them and they cry like they're the victim. And meanwhile, they're doing like extremely underhanded stuff uh, behind the scene. Well, uh, you know, you may, uh, you may regret that down the road. Uh, there may be some things that, uh, there may be some things that will make, Lofton and people maybe maybe rethink some of these things down the road. I don't know. We'll see. But um, regardless, uh, they're having to constantly talk about us on a daily basis, literally every stream, because they're losing so many people to orthodoxy. And I had a trad in the comments say, uh, "You need to produce some verified statistics to show that you that you are actually converting people to orthodoxy." Really. Uh, come to the Discord, bro. <laughs> There's 5,300 people in there, many of whom are former Roman Catholics and have converted. Uh, I literally post these comments constantly of uh, people leaving Roman Catholicism for Orthodoxy. So there's your stats, right? If you don't believe me, then uh, that's your problem. But no, it's obvious that uh, they're on the ropes, and that's why they can't deal with any of us. They won't. They were. They will never uh, interact with Ubi. They will never interact with me, which is fine. I wouldn't interact with them anyway. I've already said that. Um, and that's okay because we don't have to interact one on one to continue to make converts. Um, and really, all of this would have been avoided if the underhanded stuff hadn't occurred what a year a year ago um so you know they have this pattern they did this to craig um that's just what they do and then they publicly lie about what they do and act like they uh are your best friend and it's just all just passive aggressive just pathetic bs dude and that's but that what do you expect the, 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 and again the the real issue here is that for the trad the anger in and the uh, resentment and the frustration that is directed at us isn't actually about us um, and I, I know because I was a trad um, the anger the frustration the bitterness the lobbying of the just really lame personal attacks going after you know um, people at a personal level when we've we've done literally countless critiques on the theological level um, just suggests the weakness of that position right that people are struggling with the inherent problems in the Roman Catholic system which are not resolved and can't be resolved by any unique particular individual piece of evidence right Matthew 16 is not going to solve this this dispute right a letter in the Sixth Council is not going to resolve this dispute. 
looking at a quote of St. Maximus, right, in the middle of centuries of debate about the filioque is not going to solve the dispute. Talking about me being mean is not going to resolve this dispute because at a certain point it's obvious that uh, this is really just an excuse to get around any actual conversation or discussion about the issues. Uh, and, and by the way, it, it's, it's just illustrative, right? That the excuse that many of these people have done, even, even in the Protestant world, like an inspiring philosophy, right? He put a meme up the other day saying that if you're not uh, considered mean or abrasive, then you're not really a Christian, right? And he cited Jesus um, kicking the Pharisees out of the money changers out of the temple, well, that's exactly the argument you said that you wouldn't debate me was that I was too mean. Um, and this is just bull, this is just baloney. I mean, we organize debates all the time with Muslims, with atheists, and it just happens to be the case that really only these excessively soyish evangelicals and the excessively passive aggressive trads are really the only ones that seem to have a problem. Right? They consistently have this problem. Every one of their live streams is directed towards us. I've, I've done one live stream that mentioned Matt Fred in the last, what, two or three months. Because it's, it's such a, it's just sad. I mean, the whole level of their discussion and apologetic is done at such a low pop level that they don't understand that the more that they cover this, it's just sending more people our way. So that's fine with me. So keep doing the streams every day, every week. Um, and it's because it's not hurting us. It's not, you, you might have like you, maybe you went from a hundred to 118 or whatever thousand, but what does that matter, Matt? If like every day we're getting more and more converts, right? Out of Roman Catholicism, who cares about your stats, dude? And by the way, Matt Frad did this ridiculous thing where he, uh, I'm just using this as a point of illustration where like months ago he said, we're looking for Orthodox people to debate Eric Ibarra. Um, Jay Dyer is not allowed, right? So he put this post up months ago before they found somebody to debate Ibarra. And then everybody, of course, in his comments, hundreds of people suggested Ubi. And Matt played around like he would, he was open to that. And then of course, which I said, he's, he's, he's being duplicitous. He's not actually going to have Ubi on, which he didn't. Exactly as I predicted. Um, but, you know, he made it very clear that uh, I was not allowed anywhere near his channel. And then, uh, what, a couple months later, uh, somebody brings my name up and he acts like he's never heard of me, <laughs> right? which is totally bullshit, right? So that's what we're getting at here. These people are playing games uh, because they're girlish, because they're, they're, they're not manly. They don't just confront people and talk to them one-on-one. That was the original reason for in the Ibarra stream when I hopped on that unplanned debate. Again, people don't know that it wasn't that I just hopped on there to be mad at Eric Ibarra. It's, I've known Eric for years. We've interacted back and forth, and they'll do this thing where Ibarra did it, William, William Albrecht did it, Trent Horn did it, um, and one, oh, the uh, Timothy Gordon did it. Well, they do this thing where they bait you and prod you. And then when you stop interacting with them, then they say he won't debate. When I asked Eric Ibarra for three years to come on here and debate. And then he says, Jay won't debate. He won't. He refuses to debate. So that's why I hopped on that stream and said, I'll debate you right now. <laughs> what do you mean? I'm afraid to debate. I've been asking you for years to debate. That's what I'm saying is that people don't know the background, the back history of what these people do, like in the DMs and in the, you know, in the background. And they, they play these little, you know, ridiculous games and it's just preposterous. And again, I've hosted national TV show or uh, radio shows. I've been the fill in host for a, one of the, you know, most popular online TV radio shows for the last, what, six months? I mean, don't you think I know how to interact at a professional level with scheduling interviews and talking to people? How many interviews and debates have we scheduled for years 
tons. So this excuse that I'm mean, to, it's just bullshit. It's total baloney. And it's an excuse because these are intimidated, passive aggressive guys that literally don't know the material beyond a freshman to sophomoric level. That's the problem here. So that's the root of all this. Um, and people wonder, why are you guys always fighting with it? Because that's what it's progressed to, right? It's progressed to this kind of stuff. Anyway, let's get past. This is just so stupid. All of it is so dumb. All we have to do is look at the actual material. And look, the, these people are all, they've, they're uniates. There's nothing better to ref, refute Roman Catholicism than, than the uniate system. I mean, it's so retarded. Like, you can be, believe all the things that the Orthodox believe, right? And then act like St. Gregory Palamas is your guy when the people who are promoting this, they're all pushing the idea that we can be ecumenical and reconcile Palamas to Roman Catholicism when St. Gregory Palamas has a whole work called Apodictic Treatise on the Holy Spirit that says the filioque is satanic. Have, ev have any of these people ever talked about or even mentioned that that work no have they ever interacted with papadakis's black Rene book no they don't know what they're talking about all they do is appeal to again the pop stuff so they run away they avoid it and appeal to the pop stuff focus on well if we just get numbers we can win uh you know but guess what just having those numbers is not going to keep people roman catholic don't you understand that we've already helped thousands of people come out of SSPX, out of normative, normie, Pope Francis world, clown, papal clown mass world, and set of occultism. And, it, and it's not going to stop, Lord willing, because it is, in a sense, like an ideological worldview warfare. It is war warfare. Uh, not in a physical sense, but in an ideological, spiritual sense. And it's not because we hate Roman Catholics. In fact, again, almost all of us in the Discord that are mods or, you know, had some degree of prior interest or were Roman Catholic or believed it. Right? So how could we, we don't hate people that are Roman Catholic, but we just keep trying to stress that you got to face up to the reality. You got to face up to the arguments. You're not, you're not doing yourself any favors when out of fear, you don't want to look at the arguments and you go after people personally. When you go and try to tattle to people's bishops and priests, I mean, that's just extremely underhanded, right? And ridiculous. It's just so dumb and childish when you go after people's wives or girlfriends, which is what these people do. How? I mean, atheists haven't gone after us at that level. Roman, I mean, the the, the Muslims don't. Why is it that the the trad Roman Catholic world has this just obsessive compulsion to act like? lunatics to act like freaking berserker viking madmen anyway uh, another thing i noticed too that is a commonality this is we're going to get to the to the sherard book in a minute but i wanted to just speak on this briefly at the beginning that i noticed is a commonality between the world of woke between the world of Catholicism and, and, and the heterodox and Protestants and icons and symbology. Now you might think, how do those worlds don't relate? How does that relate? That doesn't make any sense. Well, let's think about icons in the way that we view icons, right? Um, the Bible is a kind of an icon, right? Because words are iconographic. Hence why, as you know, we call icon painters actually icon writers. They're not painters. Because they're writing a story, a truth, a, a, an idea 
conveying meaning that is eternal. Now, in an icon, obviously, there's layers and, of meaning and, and symbolic significance and so forth. And the interesting thing about icons is that you, you don't understand icons without Orthodox theology. Uh, in the next few weeks, I do also, I plan to do a live stream on St. Theodore the Studite's book on the icons. And what St. Theodore bases his whole argument for, which his argument is accepted at the Seventh Council and becomes one of the definitive theological treatises along with St. John Damascus in defending uh, the icono dual position against the icono class position. St. Theodore argues that correct Christology leads you to icons, right? Nature, person, will, energy, right? The fact that Christ is a divine hypostasis, the fact that icons pick out the second hypostasis of the Godhead and not the divine nature and not the Father, these are all concomitant with the correct theology. You couldn't have right iconography unless you had the right doctrine of the Trinity and the right doctrine of Christology. Again, Snack and I, we did a whole stream on this where we covered this, but uh, I didn't dive uh, deeply into St. Theodore's treatise on the icons. Regardless, um, we know that's the case. Now, I say that to explain that when we come to the world and we look at Groups say in the Protestant world that fall into heresies or in the history of the church that fell into heresies, many of them fell into the word concept fallacy. And if you've listened to the many discussions that Father Deacon uh, Ananias and I've had, we covered that many, many times, probably five different live streams we covered this, right? Which is, uh, there's, there's different problems with the word concept fallacy. One of those is to think that words only have one meaning or significance or one referent. Um, the other one, well, and related to that is that there is then a kind of a metaphysical assumption that the one referent is uh, basically, basically identifying these the predicate and the subject or the subject and the predicate as basically identical. And so there's this, this lack of nuance, this lack of metaphysical distinction within language and within predication that afflicts not just those people, but also in the woke realm and also in the realm of, let's say, last night's discussion on union of the unwanted. Now, if you heard that discussion, uh, let me give you an example. One guy said that because the, the uh, he said that because the cross right can be laid out as a cube, right? If you put those pieces together, therefore Christianity is cube worship, and cube worship is Saturn worship. Right, and so therefore, all monotheistic religions are Saturn worshiping religions. Let's give you another example of something I noticed, which was uh, remember back when, uh, like in the, well, a lot of you probably weren't around in the '80s, but like in the '80s and '90s, you would hear these stories of like evangelicals or Pentecostals that would get a receipt back from a store, and if in the <laughs> The number on their receipt, you know, just a, basically a just random number that just categorizes receipts. If the receipt in the uh, sequence of numbers happened to have 666, right, they would think that is the mark of the beast. Okay. Uh, let's say we have a triangle, right? Right. So, 666 six, six, six is the beast, right? Triangle. Satan! I've seen a triangle in the church. It's all seeing eye. Now, a lot of people on the YouTube sphere, right, will make this constant, ridiculous, childish, superstitious mistake about interpreting symbols. And I started to notice this morning when I was thinking about all of this that it's the same mistake across the board. Right? They don't all come to the same conclusions. But one basic mistake that all these people are making is the is of identity and the is of predication. 
or basic grammar language, right? That when we say the dog is brown, it doesn't mean the dog is identical to brownness, okay? Brownness is a feature, a trait, an accident to use, right? Aristotle's language that the dog possesses. So that's the difference between the is of identity and the is of predication, right? Now, that does actually verge on, obviously, metaphysical questions, and hence language directly typically does relate to metaphysical questions. But you'll notice that there's a, a, um, a pattern of mistake in lack of nuance that people are making in the woke realm, in the alternative media uh, goofy realm, right, uh, where people will find an image and think that that image always has one meaning. It always means that. I was reminded, for example, of a evangelical who said that halos on icons are Hindu because I saw a Hindu image that had a halo. So they're the same. And the, so at many levels, these are, well, they're fallacies. That's genetic fallacy, right? Um, but they're also mistakes of iconographic interpretation. And one of the things that we learn in Christology, right? And one of the things that we learn in metaphysics is the ability to have distinctions, to have nuance, to have layers, so to speak. And again, also connected to this is context, right? It's the context that's going to determine, right? The fact that in some instances, a, a cross could be laid out to be a cube. In some instances, it couldn't. This is so dumb, right? I mean, if I extended the bottom part of the cross down even further, then it's not a cube, dummy. <laughs> it's not a cube. That's not a cube if you extend that, okay? You can't fold that into a cube. So the fact that in some instances a cross could be laid out as a cube does not get you to cube worship, does not get you to Saturn. Not every instance of a cube relates to Saturn, obviously. How do we know when? The context will determine. Perhaps I'm writing a book or drawing something, and in this case, I want the cube to signify Saturn. But it doesn't mean that in every case it signifies Saturn. What's the easiest example of this? In the Bible, the uh, beast of a lion is a symbol that's used for God and for Satan. Does that mean that lions are inherently satanic? How dumb is that? That's stupid. Now you think, wait a minute, that is stupid. Wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. Did you, have you noticed that people are literally making this mistake where they are thinking that colors are inherently evil. I'm not kidding. Right? Remember AOC cauliflower is white and racist. Remember the story I've told you many times of the girl that I went on a date with, who was the CGI person on a Maleficent. And she said that, uh, because Angelina Jolie had a, a, a important role in the production of the film she came in and told all the cgi people that they had to ban everything that was pink i'm not kidding and and i believe her because i think these people are that loony because pinkness for her was inherently metaphysically associated with femininity and as a feminist she hated femininity i'm not i'm not kidding so this this making this mistake and having your, your worldview, your paradigm so jacked up can literally lead you into schizo-superstitious madness. That's where we get so many of the religious realm, the so-called, right, coming up with ridiculous things that the fact that a random sequence on a receipt has three sixes in a row somehow means that receipts are the mark of the beast. As if every triangle means Satan. Now, again, I know that you guys know this. Right? This, is, this is kind of common sense to the Chad nerds in this audience. But if you think about that, this is what people are doing. Remember, what did we recently see with the Amazon logo? Amazon had to 
redesign the app logo because the, the, the swoop or whatever that swoop is with the arrow on it and the little mark at the top look too much like H-I-T-L-E-R mustache. <laughs> so they had to redesign the logo. I'm, uh, so soup, this is how superstitious, that's what I'm saying is like, this is like, wow, level of stupid, right? Like, whoa, dude. And I'm not kidding. People, when they don't grasp that they're making kind of basic philosophical mistakes or grammatical mistakes even, or a basic metaphysical mistake about, they will begin to identify evil as the thing that's predicated right? For Angelina Jolie's case, pink is evil. It's like a magical schizo worldview where you have to run from the pink things in the world. I'm not kidding. I'm not exaggerating. And you say, well, that's an extreme. It is an extreme, but the world is going schizo, dude. Have you noticed? People are going crazy. And it is relevant to bring in the, the, the schizo. I'm not making fun of people that are schizo either. I'm not saying... Uh, I'm not being mean. I'm being literal. I am being literal. <laughs> All right. So how does this relate to schizophrenia? Well, if you watch videos, documentaries, I've watched a whole lot of documentaries and videos on these kinds of, again, not, not that, that I'm not any kind of psychological expert, just my observation on this stuff. A lot of reading on psychology, the way that the CIA studied it, MKUltra, all that stuff. You'll notice in the in, in the cases of the people that have uh, you know advanced or serious levels of schizophrenia, they they make um, unwarranted, non necessary, bizarre connections, right? They do the same move. Have you noticed this? Right, just like the Angelina Jolie thing, pink is attacking me because pink is evil because it's feminine, and feminine is some kind of evil thing that I have to war against. What? I'm not kidding. Like colors are evil, right? Now, there is such a thing in the occult world as color magic, where right? it was a version of this goofy superstition. And that's what I'm saying is that religious fetishes, religious uh, pagan worldviews, backwards superstitious worldviews posit illicit irrational connections between things that are not necessarily connected. So they will confuse the layers and levels of reality, just like people that do the word concept fallacy, except that they're doing it at a more extreme level. Do you see what I'm saying? It's the same mistake that's being made and on a metaphysical level. And sometimes that mistake can be so extreme that it borders or is schizo. Let me give you another example. Uh, so there was a, a, a person who emailed me many, many years ago. And it was back when I first covered uh, like Twin Peaks. I wrote a big, you know, the big essay on the esoteric, you know, worldview of uh, David Lynch, Twin Peaks. And a woman wrote me uh, a long kind of rambling email. I'm not being mean. I'm just stating that this is what happened. And she believed that Anytime she would move to a city and she would hear a song related to Twin Peaks, like Julie Cruz or the Twin Peaks theme or I don't know, whatever, that it was David Lynch sending that to mess with her. Okay. Similar ideas to the targeted individual people, right? Who claim to be targeted individuals and most of the time have men mental problems. Not being mean, just saying that they have problems with schizophrenia. And what, what is their mind doing here? Right? They're attaching loose associated things. right? So that song does relate to Twin Peaks. But the fact that that song came on the radio in some small town in the middle of nowhere, years after Twin Peaks, there's no necessary connection between that song being played and David Lynch and you hearing it on the radio. It's just irrational. But... Does that mean there's no connection? Yeah, there is. But you see the, the mistake of like identifying the levels of connection here, right? So because there is a loose association, therefore it's an identical isomorphic one-to-one. -one. David Lynch is beaming this song through the local radio station at me. 
Okay, that's that's schizo level stuff. David Lynch isn't doing that. <laughs> Think whatever you want to, David Lynch. He's not doing that, okay? I'm going to attack top. Uh, I'm going to attack this woman in a small town. We're going to beam radio signals into her head because I get off on it. So, so I'm just noticing then this pattern of people making this mistake. And it was the same mistake last night. Remember, another great example last night. This guy is like, well, a couple of people, right? I'm not being mean to these people. I'm not trying to start a fight with them. Just pointing out where I see the mistake. They're doing the thing that Jordan Ma Jordan Maxwell, so the word Saturn, Saturn, Saturday, therefore, the seventh day is Saturn worship. That's an English word, dummy. The English word Saturn day has nothing to do with the ancient Jewish word of the of Shal Shabbat. It, there's no connection. That's an English word, dummy. And then they do the same thing with words. Masons do. Let's, let's, this is a, there's a great example of the Masons that do this idiotic thing. And it's just total nonsense. It's, it's ridiculous. Um, they do. <laughs> they do. I'm not kidding. So this is another. It's a good example, though. Soul Oman. If you take the the word Solomon, oh dude, that's sun worship. Om, Om, right? And on from Egypt, dude. It's like it's a secret code. These are English. That's an English transliteration of Shalom. Okay. This has nothing to do with soul, om, or on. Shalom. The word Solomon is an English transliteration of a Hebrew word. This is super level dumb. Okay. But literally Masons, I'm not joking. That's a Masonic teaching. That's They teach that. right? I'm pretty sure Jordan Maxwell says that too. right? And I'm just trying to say that we don't have to be dumb. We don't have to fall for stupid things like this. How many times have we done the same illustration with logos? Because the word logos can have different reference. It doesn't mean the same thing in every case. Okay. Logos in the system of the Stoics is not the same thing that John is talking about in John 1 because it's the same word. Hypostasis in, in the Neoplatonic scheme is not the same thing as the way it's used in Chalcedon or the Fifth Council, just because it's the same word. And these are all, again, mistakes relating to not understanding the is of identity and the is of predication, and that words can have more than one sense. And I don't know how many different illustrations are needed to show this point. And, and still people don't, they can't get this. They just can't get it, right? They don't, they just barge forward and don't care. They don't get it. <laughs> like what? We see the same mistake with Muslims, right? Muslims do the exact same thing, right? When they talk about Allah's unity and the meaning of words, they only have one meaning. James White, just look up the word in the Greek dictionary. That's what it means. Anyway, so again, if you notice that, if you see the point that I'm getting, you'll note that our iconographic theology and philosophy gives you a nuanced way to interpret objects and their distinctions without collapsing them all into things that lead to ridiculous superstition. I mean, it gets so absurd that the way the woke person, right, who thinks that the color of cauliflower is racist, that cauliflower is racist because it is white. Milk is racist. <laughs> Do 
do you see how it's like it's literally equivalent to the schizo person who thinks that pink is attacking them pink is is after me <laughs> i don't mean pink the pop singer i mean the color pink is attacking me <laughs> all right so it's this the same level of mistake and it's exactly like animistic religions who attribute evil power to objects themselves. Do you see the mistake here? The color pink is after me. The totem pole is evil. Don't walk near that totem pole. It will get you. <laughs> right? So literally that's, do you see this? We don't walk over there because their evil gods will get us if we go near their totem pole, right? Of the feather-headed turtle man, right? Pollen boy will get you if you walk past that pole over there. That's superstitious, dummy. No pollen boys aren't going to get you for walking near some stupid pole that's badly carved with a bunch of ugly faces on it. That's superstitious, dummy. Likewise... The color pink is not attacking you, Angelina Jolie. Milk isn't racist, right? So they're collapsing the lack of nuance, the lack of metaphysical distinctions into one sense of word, one sense of meaning, literally making things evil, right? Which would be Manichaean, Gnostic, right? Because nothing that has existence is evil in itself. So when you don't have these, a worldview that provides and allows for these kinds of nuances and distinctions, you're going to fall into crazy, superstitious, goofy mistakes. And I'm not saying that superstition and animism is literally equivalent, it's, that it's only a word mistake. No, it's much more than that. But this is an element to it. This is an angle, right, that people are making these mistakes. Anyway, that didn't have anything to do with uh, the papacy per se, uh, although there are uh, similarities between some of the theological mistakes that Roman Catholics make uh, on the level of the word concept fallacy and uh, in a way relates to the absolute simplicity doctrine that they hold in regard to God. Uh, if they were consistent, they would be more like a Muslim and they would believe in something like atomism and they would collapse the properties of objects into the essence or the substance of the object. Which, by the way, Dr. Sherrard actually has a really good critique of. He has an essay where he critiques that uh, mistake in the West, uh, not just in terms of God, right, but the absolute simplicity mistake that Roman Catholics have in terms of the deity is also reflected in the way that they view objects in the world, or it should be if they were consistent. Um that essay is, I think, the one he did on immortality, Christianity and immortality. Um, I cite Dr. Sherrard making that critique, particularly about hylomorphism. All right, let's get to this book. Um, we're not going to, this is not going to be a half and half because I think this book is good enough and important enough that it just needs to be public. And we've already had some really uh, fat, nice super chats from the audience uh, that we'll get to here in a little bit. So, that already kind of covers the work that we've done so far in terms of manpower. So thank you for that. We'll be able to just keep this one public. We don't have to make it half and half. Now, Dr. Sherrard begins his book by making a great point that the church, we know, is not a human institution. Uh, and he says this because, not that Roman Catholics disagree with us on this, but that we can't allow humanist elements or... Um, Dom, like social theory elements to define or explain what the church is. The church is a miraculous institution. It's a theandric institution, just like Christ, right, is the God man. So also the church is theandric, right? It has that dual human divine aspect at the same time. And hence why it can't be reduced to any kind of human social arrangement, some kind of uh, human created uh, self-help thing. It's not a social human institution. It has an aspect of being a social human institution, but it can't be reduced to that. And he points out that you cannot have a correct doctrine of the church apart from the doctrine of the energies. Exactly. How could it be theandric if there's no essence energy distinction? Because the church has to really participate in the life 
and power of God, the divine life. If you don't believe in the essence energy distinction, then as St. Gregory of Palamas says to Barlium, then what are we participating in? And so the correct doctrine of the incarnation, as Sherard says, will determine our doctrine of the church. And if we mess up on the incarnation, it'll mess up our doctrine of the church. For this to be clear, the church must reject Platonism. And as we know, uh, in the Synodicon of Orthodoxy and in the Seventh Council and in, up into the Byzantine Empire, the church um, officially rejects Plat Platonism and Platonic theory, especially in it, when it comes to the metaphysics of the church. Now, that doesn't mean that there's not insights from Plato and Aristotle, but the systems cannot be accepted or reconciled. They are rejected officially and dogmatically. Because, of course, the basis of the systems of Aristotle and Plato are dialectical. They do not allow for a both and because they are premised on either ors, right? We've pointed this out many times, uh, many times over. The systems of the Hellenists were unity good, multiplicity lower or bad, eternality good, time lower or bad, right? And that's not true, right? Stasis good, movement bad, or lower. That's a false dialectic, right? And if anybody who believes in Christianity would obviously see that you can't make your Christian worldview fit with that presuppositional dialectic. There's nothing inherently bad about movement, about time. God entered into time, right? This is why Platonists couldn't accept the incarnation. But we simply reject the idea that temporality and change within the physical world are inherently evil. They're not. Hence why we believe in the doctrine of creation. And uh, Sherrard goes on to point out that, of course, the, the God that we believe in is personal. We cannot subsume the hypostases into uh, the usia or blend God into some kind of non-personal essence by which we um, speculate about what God is. We don't do that and we can't do that. He goes on to say that just as St. Maximus talked about the uh, creation in a sense being a veil uh, of the Logos, right? So also the church is in a sense the veil of the Logos in that he lives and abides in his church as his body. So the flesh here is the veil, citing Hebrews. And he says that we can't uh, thus accept any kind of substance dualism or any kind of radical uh, dialectical opposition, which would be the case on any of the Hellenic systems. Again, we have rehearsed this point, this argument, countless times in the last five years. The Gnostics, he says, had a problem with the idea of authority in time and space and with the body of Christ having a normative authority. Right? So the Gnostic had to, to justify their approach and their system, say, well, there is the direct perception of God, right, which the Orthodox Church holds to right, and has always held to, but it's set over against there being a historical authority in the church, right? bishops and priests, presbyters. But we don't do that. Just as there's no dialectical tension between the Logos and his body in time and space, there's no dialectical tension between the Holy Spirit living in the church and having an authoritative normative succession of bishops. Thus, if that is the case from the, the Orthodox perspective, and if the divinity of Christ is fully present in every one of the local churches, right, via the uncreated energies, then now we begin, can be, begin to understand the phrase of the early fathers like uh, St. Uh, Ignatius of Antioch, right, in his letters, when he talks about where the bishop is, there is Christ and there is the Eucharist, right? The bishop representing uh, the father, etc. Famous phrases and statements in the letters of Ignatius. Thus, where the bishop is, there is the fullness of the Eucharist and the fullness of Christ. Thus, true Catholicity, fullness, universality, exists in the local parish. And I remember the first time I heard this when I was a Roman Catholic and I started thinking, I don't understand how this is an argument for, like, why, why is this an Orthodox argument? I don't, I don't understand this. Because it's pointing out that there's nothing lacking. If you've got the bishop and you've got the presbyters, 
And you've got the liturgy and the Eucharist and the sacraments and the preaching of the word of God. There's nothing lacking that a guy over in Rome adds to your church. There's no super abundant extra special thing that a guy over in Rome has. That's divine, I'm saying. Because, yeah, so everybody agrees that uh, in the councils, custom, as Nicaea Canon 6 says, appropriated to the Roman see, privileges and prerogatives in terms of appellation, appellate jurisdiction, in terms of conciliar privileges. Nothing about a special infallible power to Peter. Nothing about this custom being given directly from God. All based on honor and prerogatives of the doubly apostolic see of Rome, Peter and Paul. Not Vatican I. Do you see that? In fact, Vatican I rejects the very thing that Irenaeus says about Rome. Right? Vatican I says that the supremacy uh, in the councils given to Rome has nothing to do with it being Peter and Paul, but solely due to Peter alone because Peter died at Rome, which is preposterous. As if that's what, like, Antioch comes from Peter. This is silly. So, but... Uh, he thus makes the point, Gerard does, that Augustine then, against the Donatist, points out that Catholicity, right, is present in the church at a local level. And yes, there is a, a, an element to which we could ascribe this to numbers and expanse throughout the nations, but it's not solely identical to numbers and expanse, right? Because in different periods, in uh, the period when St. Maximus was arguing against his patriarch, right? He said, I will side with what is true even if the entire world goes over to monophysitism, right? Athanasius, even if a whole world converts over to Arianism, right? He and a handful of bishops remained Orthodox. So it's not strictly a numbers thing, but numbers are going to be involved in this because we know we have all the predictions that the nations will come into the church. But we can't identify Catholicity with big numbers, is the point. But the idea of Catholicity relates to Christ, right, as the universal person, the universal God-man, right? Because he's a divine person, he's able to assume the universality of human nature in his singular divine hypostasis, as St. Cyril says. So we don't then identify or uh, restrict Catholicity to one patriarch or C that doesn't make any sense and by the way the phrase universal archbishop was used for multiple patriarchates all right so you can't retroactively say oh the phrase universal archbishop is used of leo so it means vatican one uh what's well, used of the patriarch of constantinople too he's called the ecumenical patriarch the universal patriarch right the the phrase is used for the pope of alexandria right so the, you, you can't this is the word mistake, right? Just read into these words whatever we want Vatican I to mean and to say back then. So the point is that, again, if the fullness of Catholicity is present in each local parish by virtue of the, the bishop and the sacraments, the life of the Holy Spirit in, in the church, what is lacking? There's nothing more that Rome could add. It's not necessary. And in fact, you don't ever see the argument that Rome at a juridical level adds something to all of the churches, the local churches, until we get to a very important part that that Sherard will cover, the idea of the separation between the mystical body and the juridical body, right? Is this argument ever made in the first seven centuries? No, it's not. Oh, but it just happens to be made after this period. Right, and this is when we, shocker, begin to see the separation of the Roman see from everyone else. And it's obvious why that's the case. <laughs> I mean, doesn't it stand to reason that the idea of a distinction, a new invented distinction between the juridical body and the mystical body arises precisely because of the need to justify the unilateral actions and self-justifications of the papacy? Now, Sherard goes on to give a chapter uh, that basically 
makes a lot of the arguments about conciliarism that you're probably familiar with. Um, I'm not going to rehearse that chapter because we've covered that many times, right? Synodal arguments, the fact that so many of the canons don't actually match up with Vatican I, the fact that Peter um, established the church at Antioch, right? So why doesn't Antioch have Rome's infallible jurisdiction and succession, or uh, universal jurisdiction, indefectibility, uh, and uh, so forth? Well, because uh, he didn't die there, right? It's just these ad hoc things they make up. And oh, by the way, there's all these uh, documents. That, uh, oh, the, sorry, they're forgeries. But by the way, still believe us, even though we used forgeries for centuries to back all this up. I mean, again, you, you realize that trads, are you aware, trads, that the Catechism of Trent relies on forgeries for a lot of those arguments? Did you know that, right? I mean, literally, you've got the pop guys out here in the trads too. Set of a contest, Matt Frad, the pop guys still citing known forged documents to prove the position. Go see Ubi Petrus's video, Papal Forgeries, where he covers just some of the more prominent and well-known ones like the Isidor pseudo-Isidorian decretals, the Samachian forgeries, uh, donation of Constantine, etc., etc., etc. And again, um, so after covering the conciliar structure, right, of the church, we get to the point about the rival ecclesiologies that will develop based on two different views of the Trinity, two different views of Christology. Thus, this leads to two different views of the papacy and the church. And one of those things will be, right, different views of the one and the many, relating multiplicity, plurality, distinctions to unity, to oneness, etc. And that will be true of the divinity. It will be true of Christ. It will be true of anthropology, man and his faculties. It will also be true of the church and her sacraments. An Orthodox Trinitarian Christological doctrine keeps the form given by the fathers of the church so that Orthodox ecclesiology, which derives from this doctrine, likewise keeps its integrity. The Orthodox tradition is concerned, uh, as we said, in terms of I'll scoot down. Uh, Western Christianity during the middle, medieval period um, evidence of certain differences in the understanding of the church begin to appear that develop to the point at which they lead to the formation of acceptance of what amounts to a radically different conception of the church and her structure. Acceptance of which is a conditional membership uh, in terms of the congregation and the faithful and this new dogmatic conception that is different in terms of conflicts on the historical plane of existence. I'm going to skip down a little further. Um, this relates, of course, to the hegemony of the Protestant world. And as a result of this, and especially the uh, many forged documents, decretals, etc., leads to later splits and divisions in Western so-called Christianity. As a result of this, we get created grace, right? That, as Ott says very clearly, the, the grace that you get in salvation is not the life of God himself is a created accident in the soul. And because it's a created accident in the soul, it stands to reason that the church as a body also can only possess created accidents and not the actual uncreated grace of God himself. Thus, God is not eminent in the world, but is in fact banished. And Thomism thus leads to this created grace doctrine and the non-present reality of God in the world. Right, So, if you don't have an energies doctrine, you lose the eminence of God. Christ is no longer the universal man who assumes the universal human nature to raise it, but rather you get the Nestorian tendencies of Christ assuming the nature of a limited number of the elect. This leads, of course, to Calvinism and Protestantism, and this is one of the unfortunate mistakes in Augustinian theology is the loss of the cosmic scope of Christ's uh, incarnation and redemption. This leads to a division between, uh, this is an interesting argument that, that uh, Sherrard picks up on, which is two types of law. Uh, there's human law, which has to operate in the, the same way as any other social political construct in, the, in terms of geopolitics. And there's also divine law. So the church, because it is a divine human institution in the Roman Catholic perspective, is able to have two types of laws. Right. One law relating to human institutions and social social constructs, etc. 
which leads to eventually the acceptance of usury, casuistry, and the legitimacy of absurd levels of lying. I'm not kidding, by the way. Um, this is very, uh, very clear when you get to uh, Saint Saint Alphonsus Liguori. Is a whole um, uh, moral theology where he, in many places, justifies ridiculous ideas of lying. So they literally become like Pharisees. Okay, the trad post tridentine Roman Catholic moral theologies go into the the ways that usury is now acceptable. The Renaissance papacy famously accepted usury when prior to that it was uh, rejected and not allowed. And the basis for this is that there's two types of law. Human law, which can allow for usury, casuistry, and lying. This will relate to the juridical church that is different, distinct from the mystical body. The juridical church will then eventually become identified with the prelates and specifically the College of Cardinals in Rome down the road. Not in this early medieval period yet. There's no cardinals yet. But eventually as the cardinalate right, comes to be, you get this idea of a division between the mystical body, right, which is all the church in Christ, the laity. But there's the juridical body, right, which is this higher tier, the papacy and the Roman prelates. And by extension, to some degree, the bishops as well. But as uh, Sherrard perceptively notices, um, the reason for this is precisely rooted in the mistaken doctrine of simplicity that Roman Catholic Church had dogmatically accepted. Uh, read the uh, Dr. David Bradshaw essay on uh, the divine, the concept of divine energies where he goes into catapanoia and shows how the, the collapsing of the distinctions into virtually virtual conception, virtual nominal uh, mental, right, leads to this mistake in the corporate juridical um in, in basically having two bodies of Christ is what it amounts to. In the conception of the church, which becomes effective in the Roman Catholic medieval world, the idea of the church on earth as the mystical body is not determined exclusively and manifested in its local Eucharistic reality. In addition to the idea of the church as a Eucharistic reality, the concept also includes the idea that the church possesses uh, an apostolic function and ministry that is corporate and juridical as a geopolitical institution, which they also do constitute the mystical body, but also is more than that, right? So it's not just the mystical body is identical to the juridical, but there is this higher extra Eucharistic mandate, right? This is the point. They are said to have been determined by Christ as an explicit extra Eucharistic mandate. That is to say, while the traditional patristic concept of the apostolic function of the church as the realization of an ecclesiastical unity in a social form is sanctioned and determined by the church as a Eucharistic reality in the Roman Catholic conception, it is sanctioned and determined by Christ in a non-Eucharistic mandate that goes beyond this to become supra or, or international geopolitical. Right? This is this international juridical concept and guess what this is where you get the idea that now the pope can is above all temporal rulers he's the king of the world now in this early medieval period where this new doctrine this new uh corporate juris right, uh, idea of the church that develops in the geopolitical sphere over above the eucharistic mystical body of the church it's not a, a, by accident that this is also the period where we begin to see the departure from byzantine theology right especially particularly the frankish period the loss of pedo communion why would the loss of pedo communion be part of this because now what we've done is we've, we've begun to set up tiers of participation in christ right Now there's a tiered structure where it's not each person, bishop or laity, having access to the same grace. There's a tiered system of 
now infants no longer partake of communion. And this is very easy to verify, right? The Roman church innovates and stops doing pedo communion around the time of the Franks, right? Around the time of Charlemagne, because you get a new theology in, uh, that's introduced. So now there's a degrees and levels of participation, like some kind of m- m- Masonic secret society, right? Where the laity and the adults have a higher degree of participation than infants. And if you say, well, that's not true, that's not true, then why aren't infants able to take communion? Of course it's true, right? The idea of hierarchy is now transferred into grades of participation in Christ, such that in, uh, what is it, Unum Sanctum? Unum Sanctum says that the Pope has a special unity, unlike anyone else, to the Trinity and to Mary, (laughs) So you better believe that there's a degrees and grades of participation. But that's not how this that's that's not how this works. The grace that the infant has in the Orthodox conception is the same grace that a patriarch has. The fact that there's a tier of authority in the Orthodox Church does not mean there's grades of being. Okay, this is so dumb. But if you accept Hellenic presuppositions, oh well then guess what? Now you have a mystery religion where these people have a higher level of participation, some super secret, great, awesome charism that no one else has. Remember, the Roman Catholic doctrine is that the Pope has the special charism of infallibility that no one else has. It's unique to him. Special graces of this higher mystery religion. No one else has it. Infants... You don't even get full-on participation in body, blood, and the Eucharist. But why? Jesus said, let the infants come to me. The church practices pedo communion for several centuries. So people think, well, pedo communion is not a big deal. Who cares? It is a big deal because this change in giving infants communion is premised on a new innovation in ecclesiology that's premised on bad philosophy and theology. It's premised on the introduction of grades of levels of participation in the body of Christ, right? And these people have a higher grade because they are members of the juridical body, especially this guy, right? This, you're not part of the juridical body of Christ if you're in this lower tier. But I got news news flash for you. The reason that reception theory is part of orthodoxy is because everybody participates in the body of christ guess what orthodox christianity is decentralized that's the big reveal here that people don't understand this is what roman catholics cannot grasp right is that the orthodox church has a balance between the one and the many there's no higher level than a bishop a patriarch is another type of bishop with canonical privileges He doesn't have super grace, right? I have 75 points of grace, right? And the bishop has 50. The presbyter has 25 points of grace. And the lady has 10 points of grace. Literally, that's how dumb this gets. That's that's the levels of the Roman Catholic medieval perspective. And I'm not joking. This literally becomes a new developed distinction in the West, in the Middle Ages, between the juridical body and the mystical body. But the body of Christ is a corporate reality in the sense that it's Eucharistic, it's liturgical, and everybody in that body has access to the exact same grace as everyone else. The patriarch doesn't have more grace powers. Obviously, this should be obvious. Now, why does this develop? Well, uh, there's an, the next chapter, it's, it's, Sherard has a really good point. After, by the way, making the argument about absolute divine simplicity uh, on pages 50, 1, 2, 3, he gets into some of the historical models in Roman state law that provided the basis for this innovation. It is not only, let's, let me find this. Um, where do we get the idea that Peter... Right? And his successors become the vicars, right? the rulers of the estate that Christ gives, right? and which eventually develops into being 
literally king of all kings on earth, universal god emperor, Kwisatz Haderach. Where do we get this idea? Well, <clears throat> the idea is, of course, that Peter inherits the estate, the office, right, that was given to him. And with regard to this office, there's no dis difference between Pope and, and the Pope and Peter himself. So literally everything stated to Peter now becomes stated to every successor. In fact, with regard to the office, and with regard to the supreme, supreme jurisdictional powers, there's no difference between the Pope, Peter, and Jesus. Christ had hand in turn, again, listen to what I said. Don't misunderstand me and take me out of context. With regard to the office and the jurisdictional power, there's no difference between Pope, Peter, and Christ. Obviously, Roman Catholics would say there's a difference between Peter and Jesus but not in terms of jurisdictional powers. Christ handed these powers to Peter, and Peter handed these over to all of his successors. By it's Vatican I. Hence, the Pope is the vigor of Christ on earth. Vicarius, Vicarius Christi, the special agent appointed to rule over the whole church on earth according to all the full monarchical powers that Christ himself possessed. Now, it is not only in respect to this concept of succession, however, that the papacy is indebted to Roman can, to Roman law. Indeed, once the idea of the church on earth as a collective corporate juridical body of baptized human beings emerged in the way that it did, it became necessary to implement principles of practical governance right, on lines effective for other human societies. Then it was more or less inevitable that the model for these principles and practices would be found in secular Roman law and government. This was virtually the only model available to those in the West. Moreover, the medieval popes and their advisors were not, for the most part, born and bred in Rome and steeped in its legal tradition, <clears throat> which is ironic, right? Excuse me, were, for the most part, born and bred in Rome and steeped in that legal tradition. Hence, the submission to Roman law characterizes many features of the papacy. It characterizes the concept of the primacy itself as the corporate society of all baptized Christians, and the church is endowed with the, with the corporative qualities on the Roman law model. Its government, like that of any other society, needs authoritative guidance, recognition, and this authority by uh, the governed. And thus, the society is a corpus, right? The corporate union of all Christians. <clears throat> it follows that this collective, excuse me, this directive authority must be exercised by some corporate head, a CEO. Who's the CEO of the church? The model for this headship is to be exercised by the Pope provided by the Roman state and its legal system, the Pontifex Maximus. Thus, it was provided by the Augustan Principate, right? The Principiate model of the Princeps, right? Of Caesar Augustus, the head of the entire corporate state. As such, he possessed supreme auctoritas. Originally in the Republic, this auctoritas, remember by the way, that uh, Ubi completely demolished Ibarra on the phrase Octoritas. <clears throat> Originally in the Republic, the Octoritas had been vested in the Roman Senate. With the, the Augustan principle, it now passed to Augustus the man. The Senate, which, uh, accident, uh, which incidentally provided the model for the College of Cardinals, became increasingly a passive partner. Right? You ever wondered why there was no College of Cardinals in the first seven centuries? Uh, hello, the Roman Church is an innovation. Can you guys not figure this out? Augustus possessed the highest authority in the state. The princeps representative represented the principal primacy and the authority, the auctoritas, now attached to a source of decision supplementing and needing at need, transcending the other sources of decisions. This authority could not be shared, but it could not be exercised by means of positive, legally secured power. This power or of these powers could be shared. Uh, such sharing did not divide the monarchy of the Principate. It merely supplemented or extended it. It was this Principate, which, with the authority attached to it, that the Pope was claiming on the grounds that the Roman Church alone possessed, possessed the Apostolic Asedi, right? It alone was the Apostolic See, to the exclusion of the others, even though all the way up into St. Gregory, the Pope St. Gregory the Great, he calls... Rome, Antioch, and Alexandria, the seat of Peter. Consequently, uh, Rome eventually declared that it alone had the Petrine Commission. 
the direction of the corporate body of the Christian society demanded the exercise of the juridical power given to St. Peter by Christ. And Peter had monarchical powers to rule over the church on earth, and these powers constitute the principatus, the apostolica sedis, right? So again, all of the Roman legal categories are simply borrowed and crossed over into the governance of the church. And the problem is not that the church is using ideas from Roman law, Byzantine canon law, etc. Yeah, yes, it does. The Byzantines were Romans. The point is not that. The point is that the office of the papacy is taking a role that Caesar had and applying that to him alone to the exclusion of all the other canonical privileges and apostolic sees. It's silly. Now, he makes a good point that uh, by the time of Unum Sanctum and up into the Council of Florence, if you read the decrees of the Council of Florence, this union with Rome was absolutely necessary such that no grace extended outside of union and communion with Rome. In fact, the Council of Florence explicitly states, famous quote in Denzinger, that even if you give yourself as a martyr outside of communion with the Pope, you're not saved, you're damned. And today, Roman Catholics throughout the world uniates, honor countless people who died outside of communion with Rome as saints. There's an easy, flat-out, obvious contradiction in Roman Catholic dogma. Clear as day. I mean, Florence is explicit and goes to the extreme to, to explain even to the point of martyrdom. Even if you die for Christ as a martyr outside of communion with the Bishop of Rome, it doesn't avail you for salvation. And Roman Catholics today do the exact opposite of that. And they honor all kinds of people who died outside of communion with Rome. In fact, Russian Catholics revere all of the Orthodox saints. This is crazy. It's an obvious contradiction. Oh, let, let me give you a PhD thesis. Give, let me have Let me spill a thousand pages to explain how it's possible to die outside of Rome. And they, all they do is reinterpret Florence, right? Florence is a huge boon for Roman Catholic dogma. Now, eventually, uh, this leads to ideas and notions of supreme power beyond even what Augustus had. <laughs> the Pope goes way beyond, right, what Caesar had. And this is interesting because I seem to remember in the Gospels, Jesus says something like, amongst the Gentiles, they lord it over one another. But amongst you, my 12, it shall not be so. You will not organize yourselves like lords over one another. And is there anything more lordish and worldly than the pretensions of the medieval papacy? to be the head of all emperors in the world? I mean, really? <laughs> right. Among you it shall not be so. Right. You will not organize yourself like the rulers of the world. Literally, the Roman bishop literally organized himself like the supreme ruler of the world, Caesar Augustus, and literally goes beyond him to crazy levels. Now, as you guys know, in the Middle Ages... Everyone knew that, wait a minute, okay, nobody's claiming in the first seven centuries that the Bishop of Rome is not just head of the whole church and supreme jurisdiction, infallible, indefectible, but he's even above all of the, the, the secular rulers and can do whatever he wants. And the Roman side said, uh, well, uh, we have these documents, uh, donation of Constantine. Right? So, so they have the, what, what backed it up? Forgeries. Do the post-Vatican II popes make the claims of the medieval popes? Uh, no, they don't. Okay, Urban II calling crusades. Post-Vatican II popes praying in mosques toward Mecca. If you can't see that is a contradiction, I can't help you. There, there's, there's nothing we can do for you. Okay, that's not the same church. Calling crusades in the Middle Ages, Pope Urban against Muslims. Benedict and Francis praying towards Mecca in mosques is not the same church. But guess what? If this church innovated and 
went off in a crazy direction in the second millennium, which is what we say, well, then it makes sense, doesn't it? Now we begin to see why there would be centuries of innovation, why there would be the acceptance of usury, why there would be changes in levels of participation in Christ in the mystical body, all of which is ludicrous and nonsense, stupid. In fact, it's so silly that when you get the period of three different popes, right, during the Great Western Schism, what settles this dispute? A council. But a council, they're not, <laughs> councils aren't above the Pope. <laughs> I mean, this is so silly, right? It's just like, and they just play games, right? They just play games. Uh, no, no, no. Anyway, so Sherrard moves on to talk about um, the difference between the ecclesiologies that develop post-first millennium in East and West. And he addresses the uh, Petrine arguments, and he notes that, you know, so many of the church fathers, they don't give a Vatican I exegesis of Matthew 16. Why is that? If this was, as Vatican I says, the universal understanding of the church from the earliest days, wouldn't we expect the church fathers to give that exegesis of Matthew 16? And famously, of course they don't, right? Do some of them apply it to Peter? Sure. But Peter is present in every bishop, right? That's what many of the church fathers, Augustine, Cyprian, they make that point. And other interesting arguments that Dr. Sherrard makes, which is that if it was the case, as you've heard me make, that the Vatican I notion of primacy was universally understood even in the earliest centuries of the church, why wouldn't they just appeal to Rome to settle the canon? Why would there be centuries of debate about the canon of Scripture? Wouldn't everyone just say, uh, Peter, please tell us what the canon is? Wouldn't they just write on every dispute to resolve the matter? And indeed, he debunks, of course, many of the famous misused texts, right, from Cyprian, from others, right, that are taken out of context, where Cyprian applies the Petrine Episcopate to every bishop. And if you look at Matthew 18, that's what Jesus does. All the stuff that Jesus says in Matthew 16, two chapters later, he says to all of them, right, Matthew 18, Assuredly, I say to you, to the whole college of the apostles, whatever you bound, bind on earth, will be loosed, will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that uh, any of you agree concerning on earth concerning my name and you ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three of you are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. That's synodal. That's communal, right? Why didn't he just say, ask Peter. And when, it, and, and when I establish my church, I shall bind you all to the decision of Peter. If you have any problem, if you ask anything from Peter, it will be done for you. It's the College of Bishops. Peter is the representative of the College of Bishops. Right? Nobody ever denied that or had a problem with that. But the idea that it's exclusive to Peter is just ludicrous given two chapters over. It's said to all of them. The very thing he said to Peter is said to all of them. Binding and loosing is what the keys are. The Matthew 16, 18, 16 to 18 keys is binding and loosing, jurisdiction, blah, blah, blah. That's what he's talking about here in Matthew 18. It's not exclusive to Peter. Does he blow on Peter and then tell Peter to blow on all the other disciples? No. And so we see that it's the most strained, tenuous eisegesis to back up these ludicrous pretensions, right? Right? that being representative or core episcopi of the College of Apostles within, what, seven centuries is I'm the supreme God ruler of all temporal rulers. Do the Roman Catholics even know that the, the popes claim this? Peter was in Jerusalem. Peter was in Antioch. <laughs> and Christ breathed on all the apostles. Pentecost, the Spirit comes on all of them. 
It doesn't fall upon Peter and then Peter lay his hands on the college. It goes to all of them because it's a college. It doesn't go to Peter alone. And then, he, of course, he covers many of the forgeries, uh, the forged epistle of Clement to James. He covers forged, other forged uh, documents that Ubi's covered. I'm not going to go over that. You guys know that stuff. And again, he again points out that um, if you don't have Christology right, you're not going to have ecclesiology right. And none of the, the, the Roman Catholics get their triadology and their Christology right. Uh, they don't see a connection between Christology and ecclesiology. But shouldn't it be obvious that the church is the body of Christ? It's dependent on Christology, how we're going to understand the, the church. And what happens when we see the rise of the papacy? What happens when we get this Apollinarian Christology and Apollinarian ecclesiology? Right. Yes, he calls it an Apollinarian ecclesiology. Interesting. To put it succinctly, what became effective for the Roman world in its proper perspective, we must go back to the 5th century and attempts of the theologians at Antioch to re re refute, rebut what was known as the Apollinarian heresy. Apollinaris maintained that the real unity in the person of Christ was only intelligible if the Logos did not take on the whole of human nature, complete in body, soul, and reason, body, soul, intellect. Rather, Apollinaris taught, which, by the way, William Lane Craig holds to this heresy, that he joined himself to a human body of soul, but the intellect, the moving principle, right, in the, the incarnate logos is not a human intellect. It is the logos that replaces the human reasoning or intellectual faculty in the incarnation, and thus this results in a new composite nature of the incarnate logos, that the, which the theologians of Antioch attempted to um, do away with. Thus, the humanity of Christ is completely passive in the Apollinarian scheme. It seemed to eliminate the significance of the human element in terms of Christ, right? Because it's not allowing Christ to be fully human, because the logos takes the place of the human reasoning faculty. Hence, the Antiochians insisted that the divine and human natures in Christ were regarded as uh, perfect, each and whole in themselves. They insisted on the fully human reality of Jesus, including human free will, human reasoning. Unlike Apollinaris, they saw in Christ one substance of the Logos, to which in addition to these characteristics, right, there was an imperfect human nature that had been attached. The Antiochians affirmed in response, two natures in Christ uh, but the natures were not altered in terms of their essence by this union. Thus, in Christ, there was two natures existing in the one hypostasis. Thus, uh, as a result, there's a deficient Christology from Apollinaris, obviously, right? Now, what happens then in terms of the church? This will affect the body of the church such that in the Roman system, there's a tendency towards the opposite error, right? So in the Monophysite scheme, right, the, the church becomes, well, I mean, they're inconsistent, so you're never going to get a clear answer from Coptics and people like this as to in what sense the church is theandric. Uh, in fact, uh, Pope Shinauta has essays saying that he doesn't even believe in theosis. So you're never going to get a clear answer from them because they're confused over these issues. In the West, however, the response to the tendency of monophysitism is the opposite. The Western tendency is toward a Nestorian ecclesiology. Although it was Leo's text which provided the basis for the Chalcedonian formula, yet in practice it was the Antiochian point of view which became the dominant trend in the Western theological tradition. The problem with the Antiochian uh, in, uh, interpretation, not everybody in Antioch, but the post-Chalcedonian Antiochian tradition, which has a neo-nestorian reading of leo okay this is what's rejected at the fifth council leo's words rather than the unity of the two natures in the purchase of christ with the hypostasis of the divine logos acting as a single subject in the two natures this is rather confused right 
he goes on to say that uh, this ends up positing in the West a dualistic Christology, which sees Christ more as God and man than as a theanthropic union or synthesis, right? So there's a notion of Christ that he is basically, uh, it's a misunderstanding and a basically a freezing of the right of the tone. Christ is the sacrificed victim that plays so large a part that was stressed above the humanity or manhood of Christ as something so distinct from his divinity that he can offer to the Father as an atoning sacrifice. This theory, therefore, also presupposes a sense of a strong ontological gap between God and man. God and man represented two utterly distinct poles of existence between the act of, of mediation or atonement that has to take place, the human nature that is to be envisaged as a reality existing in its own right may be linked to the divine but it can be envisaged as it can be envisaged as existing apart from the divine so in other words the the christological mistake that develops in the west which is a tendency towards nestorianism is due to not understanding the true reality of the union so it's avoiding the mistake of the monophysites which has a new hybrid result of the union right which is a mixed hypostasis and not understanding that hypostasis is the sole subject right of a, the divine logos right in all the incarnate actions of christ and so what you get is a division between the two right it's a nestorian ecclesiology in the west which was formulated as a result of trying to respond to apollinarianism and it's it's another mistake. That's why the, the West doesn't understand the Fifth Council, right? How many Roman Catholics talk about Justinian, about the Edict of Justinian, and the importance of that council, which condemned the Antiochian reading of, the, of Leo and the Tome. So after the Fourth Council, after Leo, after the Tome, there's two rival interpretations of how to understand the Tome. One of them is the mixed hybrid understanding of hypostasis that the hypostasis itself is a hybrid concoction of, of god man the other one is that it's the hypostasis possessing two natures and that it's the same he before and after the incarnation that being the neo kyrillic understanding the fifth council condemns and rejects the antiochian misinterpretation and affirms the Kyrillian understanding of Chalcedon. This is beyond dispute. This is the whole point of the Kenneth Vesha book. Now, how does that relate to today's topic? Because in the West, because they don't believe and understand what the Fifth Council actually says, they don't even care about Justinian. Justinian isn't a saint for the Roman Catholics, you see. They don't understand that this Christology affects ecclesiology. When Christ became incarnate, he communicated his uncreated glory to his humanity. The humanity participates in the uncreated glory via this communication, this energy. This is what the Sixth Council teaches. That's how his humanity is deified, by participation. Thus, it requires a real essence energy distinction. So, really, they don't believe the Fifth Council. And they're stuck with a in many cases, quasi Nestorian reading of Chalcedon and Leo. Not all of them. I will say, for example, that Ott, if you read Ott, Ott correctly understands the Sixth Council. Now, whether Ott is consistent is a different question, right? Because he does admit that graces are communicated by the Logos to his human nature, right? And so he does correctly understand and interpret the Fifth and Sixth Councils. But whether that's consistent with his divine simplicity doctrine is a different issue, because it's not, <laughs> right? So... I'm not saying that this is applicable to every single Roman Catholic. I'm speaking generally here of the tendency to think that hypostatic union is really just the last thing said about this is Leo and Chalcedon. No, Leo's tome is deficient. It is not clear enough. That's why there's the fifth council to explain and clarify the tome. To explain that Strictly speaking, the hypostasis is not a result of the incarnation because it precedes the incarnation. 
The hypostasis in terms of the core personal subject is only the Logos, the second person of the Godhead. And he underwent no change in the incarnation. He being the second person of the Godhead, the Logos, but he assumed human nature. And so he becomes dual or diophysite by assuming human nature and not assuming a human person. There is no created hypostasis in Christ at all. And to say that it is, it puts you under the condemnation of the fifth council. Now, with this idea of the offering of the infinite debt that's paid, right, in the West, the development after Augustine moves into Anselm of the fact that the Logos has to offer himself to the Father to pay the infinite debt. So now we get the gap, right? Again, this is predicated on the fact that there's a loss of the deification of the human nature by the Son. Now there has to be one hypostasis offering that humanity as a payment for the infinite debt of sin incurred as a result of the fall. But the problem with this is a paradigm mistake as a whole after augustinian theology dominates in the west there's the complete loss of the cosmic scope of christ's incarnation which was never lost in the east and that's why the seventh council follows the teaching of saint theodore which is that christ assumed universal human nature hence why all men are resurrected and in the west that is lost christ ultimately is offered in terms of the efficaciousness and the final perseverance for the elect alone. Is there some general sense in which he dies for all men? Sure, of course. But ultimately, the death is only effectual and meaningful for the chosen fixed number of elect. And that leads to ultimately Christ assuming only the nature of the elect. That's why you have questions in Augustine and later theology in the West, well, then why are the wicked resurrected? I mean, they don't have any connection to Christ, right? And by the way, the, the physical world has no connection to Christ's incarnation, right? Romans 8 doesn't matter. It doesn't because now you've got natural theology. Romans 8, the created world is not directly related to the logos. And so they lost the cosmic scope of Christ's incarnation and redemption. Clearly, the whole of this theology is wrongheaded. And that's why would you even have to bring in people like Hans Urs von Balthasar to bring in the East to resurrect what was lost in the West if you have the goods? What did Bishop Barron say? We need to rediscover patristics. I thought you had the goods. Why you got to rediscover something that's lost if you've got it? Why do you have to bring Maximus back in via von Balthasar if you've got the goods? This is, this is silly. You don't have the goods. That's the point. It's you that lost. It's you that departed. What did they depart from? A true union between the second person of the Godhead and the humanity that he assumed. Universal human nature assumed in his singular divine hypostasis. That's the whole argument of St. Theodore in his treatise on the holy icons. That true union allows for a real participation of the humanity of Christ in the divine energies that he communicates to it. Cyril says this. Maximus says this. The Sixth Council says this. It shouldn't even be in dispute. But in order to have a real participation of humanity and divinity, you've got to have the essence energy distinction. It can't be another created reality that we're given. Because if it's another created reality, then Arius was right. Right? Why can't another creature save us? This is the argument Palamas makes to the barley mine. So the devastating critique that Sherard concludes this section with is that the loss of the cosmic scope of Christ's incarnation and redemption leads to a loss of theosis, a loss of true union. And if there's a loss of true union in terms of understanding the incarnation, then duh, it's going to result in a loss of true union in the ecclesiology of the church. And surprise, surprise, guess what? The same absolute divine simplicity mistake leads to filioque. 
And the filioque is a subordination of the spirit. As St. Gregory Palamas argues, he calls it anti-Trinitarian in the Apodictic Treatise on the Holy Spirit. They call Palamas their saint. How could you call an anti-filioquist your saint? How could he be condemned for centuries and then become your saint? This is so silly. So how many bodies does Christ have? Does he have a temporal juridical body? And a mystical body? Or does he have one body? And that whole system of ecclesiology is predicated on the Father as the sole arche, mono arche of the Trinity. Because nature, person, will, and energy in the Trinity are going to be reflected and directly impacting how we view nature, person, will, energy in Christ and in Christology and how participation occurs in the church as a body, corporately, and in the Eucharist. It's the same, don't you understand? It's the same principle. The way that Christ's humanity participates in his uncreated divinity is the exact same way that the Eucharist is the body, blood, soul, and uncreated life of God. And so he says that this whole doctrine stems from a mistake on unity in God. The principle of unity is not the person of the Father in the West. It becomes the impersonal essence. And if you make the impersonal essence of God the principle of unity and your starting point for your Ordo Theologiae, this will lead you to heresies about filioque, heresies about how God's present in the world, namely his presence imminently via the energies is banished, which it is, and you get an imbalance in the one and the many, an imbalance between the principle of unity and the principle of distinction or multiplicity. Multiplicity does not have one meaning, by the way, idiots. It doesn't mean multiple substances in every case, right? Multiplicity could mean different types of things, right? The persons in God are multiple. It doesn't mean multiple substances. I'm speaking specifically to certain people there. So when we get an imbalance between God as one and God as three, this leads to an imbalance in the church, which is the reflection of the Trinity, where a principal higher level is given to unity. Right? The Pope becomes now the sole principle of unity in the church. Why? Because of the essentialist error of Western theolo theology. So again, vindicated, right? That's, that's, that's been the sole argument that we've consistently made for years here, which is that correct Trinitarian theology is going to lead you to correct Christology. It's going to lead you to correct ecclesiology. It's going to lead you to correct anthropology and correct sacramentology and correct eschatology. Now, have any of the people, Matt Frad. Lofton, Ibarra, have any of them dealt with any of the arguments that are this substantial and at this tier? No, they do not. They ignore it. They don't want to talk about it. They pretend like it doesn't exist because they're unable and incapable of dealing with arguments and theology at this level. All they have is pop arguments, and that's only going to serve to convince people that don't know anything. And then five, ten years from now, they figure out all the problems in Rome, and then they come our way. So you're only doing a disservice to yourself, guys, by not answering the actual things that we're presenting. And just, so just keep sending people our way. Keep covering orthodoxy because all you're doing is advertising for us. So thanks, by the way. Shout out to Matt Fred. Uh, highly recommend this book. It's only 100 pages. One of the best 100-page critiques of the papacy. So there we have it. That's kind of uh, the overview here. I uh, hope you appreciate this. Please hit like and share. <clears throat> um, by the way, don't expect any of those guys to actually address this stuff. They have, they've not addressed anything. This was the point Sneck was making yesterday, right? None of the people from that realm have addressed any of the substantial arguments that, that we make. They, in fact, they just pretend like Apodictic Treatise on the Holy Spirit doesn't even exist. They don't even know it exists. Do they even know it exists? That there's that St. Gregory Palamas wrote a whole book against their whole church? 
and they act like he's their saint and the positions are all the same. We're all just saying the same thing, bro. It's just silly, childish, dishonest, right? So until you can throw something better back at us beyond personal jabs and, you know, tweets, all you're doing is sending people to us. And, and by the way, guys, I think you see, right? When, when we cover stuff at this, this tier, this level, now you see why they don't want to interact. It has nothing to do with me being mean. It has nothing to do with some conspiracy doc, uh, uh, video I made five years ago. That's all excuses, right? It's all excuses. So there you go. Like and share, and uh, let's get to some of these super chats. First one is, where do we go back? By the way, somebody left a super chat uh, last stream that come that came in late. <clears throat> I know it's not related directly to orthodoxy, but what parish should I look at? Uh, OCA, Serbian, Greek, Ukrainian, Antiochian in Canada. Um, I would not go under Go Arch, so I would avoid Greek if that's where they are. Um, I would not. Uh, I would check out all of the different ones and see. Um, so you just have to, there's no easy way to tell you like what jurisdiction is going to be free of problems. There's always problems in jurisdictions. So you just have to check them out. Philip Edenhorn, $10. This is the best channel on YouTube. I don't know about that, but thank you for that. I'll, I'll take it. What would you say is your favorite text by the early church fathers from 100 to 600. Well, there's not a favorite because there's so many that are just really important. Um, so it's really hard to pick out. I mean, you got volumes of, of works, right? So there's not, it's going to be hard to pick out a text. That's the favorite. <clears throat> uh, if you're new to the subject, I would start with um, maybe on the incarnation by St. Athanasius. That's a good place to start. Then I would move to St. Gregory Nazianzus' five theological orations. It's a little book you can get from St. Vladimir's. Then I would move to um, the Cappadocians like Basil's letter 234. I would read uh, Basil letter 38, which is actually Gregory of Nyssa letter 38. Um, then I would read On the Holy Spirit by St. Basil. Then I would read the catechetical lectures of St. Cyril of Jerusalem because they're a great window into the mindset of the church in his day. And they're still great catechetical, a great catechetical work. Um, so there's a lot. Uh, you don't want to pass up St. Cyril. Read On the Unity of Christ by St. Cyril, little book. So there's just so many, but those are good places to start in the Church Fathers. Where's your boy Tristan? Make it rain. Thank you, Tristan. I think that's Tristan, or that could be a pseudo Tristan. Maybe it's another Tristan. Maybe it's some other Tristan I don't even know about. Maybe the Tristan that we know as Lil Aids is the pseudo Tristan, and that's actually the real Tristan that's being held hostage in that boomer mud hut. Maybe Tristan that we think is Tristan assumed the identity of the real Tristan, and that was the real Tristan sneaking out of the mud hut dungeon to uh, send a secret code to make it rain because if, if we make it rain in Ecuador, it'll wash away the mud hut and he'll be able to get free out of his underground prison that little AIDS has him in. Zed, $3. Intellectually, I am more convinced of the Orthodox, of Orthodox over Roman Catholicism. However, when I, whenever I seriously consider going to Orthodoxy, I can't help but think of Unum Sanctum an extra ecclesia nulla salus. Any advice on over overcoming this? Well, the first thing I would say to that, that's just a real simply refuta simple refutation of that, is that the Roman Catholic Church today does not hold to the medieval understanding of unum sanctum and extra ecclesia nulla salus, you see. So this is an evolution in doctrine. And how can truth evolve? How can the idea of what was necessary to be saved in the Middle Ages change? All right. Truth doesn't change, it doesn't evolve. We might get more precise in terms of what is true, what Christology is, what our doctrine of the Eucharist is, but it doesn't evolve. 
it can't be necessary to be in communion with the Pope in the Middle Ages. Oh, but by the time of Vatican II, now you can be a Muslim and be saved. Now you can be Hindu and be saved, right? Nostra Atate says that Hindus approach God in love. Leaving open the possibility that you can be saved in Hinduism, right? All religions now, according to Nostra Atate, are just kind of loose paths to God. Because God is a generic theism. All the religions are in a concentric circle connecting you to, right? So this is the, the, the new ecclesiology post-Vatican II. Do you understand, by the way, um, that it doesn't just pause it. It doesn't just posit that you could potentially be saved in another religion. It's, and this is made really clear in the recent Francis stuff, right? Where in, in the, you know, Pachamama and his new encyclical Fratelli Tutti, whatever it is. It's, it's concentric spheres of communion with Francis as the head of the world religions. Have you not noticed this, right? That's the new ecclesiology. Father Peter Hears has a whole book on Vatican II's new ecclesiology. So now, contrary to the clear, right, like you got to be in Christ, okay? There's no, there's no concentric circles of communion with Christ and the papacy. Now, the, the, this is the idea of the Roman Catholic Vatican II system. There's just this, we're all in kind of degrees, right? On a circle of concentric circles of communion. So the Roman Catholics and the Pope, like that's the highest level of communion. Eastern Orthodox, they're kind of like closest in a, in a, in a like one step removed degree of communion with the papacy. Then out here, we got the Protestants and the non-denominational guys, because, you know, they still believe in the Trinity and the Incarnation. So they're just further out, right? And then, oh, by, and by the way, I'm not kidding. The new encyclical has prayers for Unitarians. Okay, so then we can put the, the, the Unitarians, the monotheists, uh, Muslims out here. And then even further out here on the spectrum is the pagans, Hindus, etc. Okay, there's no such thing as concentric circles of communion with the Pope as the head of the world religion. This is where the papacy is taking you, right? So do you see why I'm not trying to be angry and mean to Lofton or Frad or any of these people? I'm literally telling you, I, I believe that the papacy is structured to do this, to create this anti-church, a pseudo-church, because of its ecclesiological, Christological heresies, Trinitarian heresies, where all the world religions are in this new religion under Francis. And if you can't see that that's what's coming from Pachamama and Fratelli Tutti and the Amazon Synod, all of which are logical outworkings of Vatican II and Nostra Aetate, I mean, I, there's not much more that we can do here, right? So that is on you. I mean, we, we just had one. Did you see the tweet from that crazy trad the other day? The guy who literally accused me of being some kind of Satanist last year literally comes out on his Twitter saying, yes, I do ritual magic and I invoke demons, but it's okay because I do it within the context of indigenous Catholicism through ritual magic because my family is from a long line of bloodline sorcerers or something. I mean, th that's what we're talking about. These people are like mentally ill. That's what I'm trying to say. And spiritually ill. That's the point here. The Roman Catholic system is a system of dead works. It doesn't have the power to do the things that we're talking about, right? You can't get the, it's like going to an empty hospital, right? It's like going to a hospital with no doctors and no medicine. Like it's not going to, it's just a building. It's not going to do any good. <laughs> it's just guys doing stuff, hanging out, talking about what is actually in the Orthodox Church. That's the point here. So 
it's not that I hate those people or I don't like them. I want those people to be healed, to come on over to our side. That's what we're here to do. That's the purpose. That's it. And you can't get that in a bogus system that has all the earmarks of a false religion and a cult, all the earmarks of a mystery religion, openly calling itself now the new world religion. I mean, Francis just said the other day that uh, if we don't fix global warming, there'll be another flood. I mean, this guy doesn't even know the script. There's not going to be another flood. <laughs> the, the scriptures say he can't have another flood. I mean, it's, it's just crazy level, right? But it's a system. And as a system, it's a very powerful idol. And that's the problem here. That's why it, that's why it has such a hold on people. And when you ask people why they're so wedded to it, they typically answer for cultural reasons. Who's my family? My family, bro. My culture. My nation. Right? I mean, they're way more nationalistic than Orthodox, ironically. At least the European branches of it, right? Of tri Catholicism. I mean that in a bad sense, in the sense of like an idol, right? That I believe this religion because I come from a long line of syncretist Brazilian sorcerers. I'm not kidding. That's what that trad guy who spent two years attacking us said the other day on his Twitter. I feel sorry for that guy, right? I'm not I'm not that guy's enemy, right? That's what I'm trying to get at here is that that, that guy, because he has such severe doubts about Roman Catholicism, this is what he said in his tweets that about Roman Catholicism, that he feels the need to engage in ritual magic to try to reprove to himself that there's evil. I mean, that's what you get. That's why it is the sickness of dead religions and dead works. They do not provide and give you the life and the power that you're seeking. They can't heal you. It's like a hospital that's empty. It's a, just a building that doesn't heal. Duke of Earl. No, wait. Uh, so that's what I would say to you, Zed, is that just the fact that they don't teach Extra Ecclesia and Nola Salus should tell you that that's not the right church because the true church doesn't taint, change its theology. <clears throat> Water Ashton, $5. Thank you for that. Duke of Earl, $10. Two years, three months ago, you slapped me aside my head with trad cat, with my trad, you slapped my trad cat head with St. Gregory of Palamas. And by God's grace and mercy, I'm being baptized into the Holy Orthodox Church this Sunday. Thank you, brother. Yeah, exactly. Some guy, some try was said that, that we don't actually convert anybody. Yeah, right. Every day people uh, are messaging me. Literally every day I get messages about people converting. So uh, many years to you, Duke of Earl. It's awesome to hear you coming to the church. Anon, wow, biggest super chat we've had in a long time. $200. Holy crap, dude. That's awesome. Um, anonymous, but hey, you want to throw down them fat super chats. That's okay. No, I'm not drinking, by the way. This is coffee. Not that I think it's wrong to drink. It's just every time I, every time I drink a cold brew coffee, who we got him? He drinks, he lies, because he said he doesn't drink. <laughs> a non $200. Dystopian cyber warrior for Christ. I'll take it. Flyer Virtue, $15. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Flyer Virtue. Much appreciated. Um, David, $3. Does the... Catholic Church use or study gematria? Does it have any significance to the church? Not any substantial significance. I mean, sometimes the church fathers do um, utilize the principle of numerology and numeric significance in the scriptures and in exegesis. Augustine does this many times. Um, you could look at um, even even a, a, a decent book by Protestant, E.W. Bullinger's book, uh, Number in Scripture, is pretty good. Um, nothing heterodox in that work that I can think of. It's, it's a good kind of apologetic angle. Uh, but gematria itself is a Kabbalistic method of kind of reading like wild, crazy stuff into all these patterns and, and numeric versions of texts and words. And most of that, no. Um, however, uh, in a few instances, yes, John in the apocalypse is doing a form of gematria when he does Nero as 666. So uh, read Ken Gentry's book, uh, Before Jerusalem Fell, to see in what way 
John is utilizing a code there because actually in the ancient world, they didn't have most of the time separate number systems. So Greek and Hebrew, they use the letters, right, for numbers. So there's nothing that uh, mystical woo-woo per se. But typically speaking, no, Gematria itself is a worthless enterprise. Big money, 10 bucks. Thank you, big money. By the way, uh, Gematria, by the way, in many cases leads to the very thing that I was criticizing at the beginning of this video, right? People coming up with uh, irrational, absurd connections between things that are not connected, right? I mean, you could, you could, you could make through number transposal anybody's name or anything say anything, right? And you get that stupid Bible code crap. Giggle Chianza, 10 bucks. Thank you. Very silent, but also very 10 bucky. I'll take that 10 bucks. Fawns, very silent, but still five bucky. I'll take it. Bert, five bucks. Thanks, Jay. Great discussion. Thank you, Bert. Phil Cowan, uh, $10. I'm a recent Orthodox catechumen. Thank you mostly to Pajot, Jonathan Pajot and your work. Thanks for all you do. Thank you. Much appreciated. By the way, I did see that uh, Jonathan spoke to uh, Jordan Pearson, which uh, I have not watched that show, but I heard from Tristan that it sounds like Pearson is still interested and open to orthodoxy. So that's awesome. So def definitely everybody pray for uh, the conversion of Jordan, Jordan Pearson. We got to remember that a lot of the people that we interact with that maybe are hostile to us now, not Jordan Pearson, but I'm saying like the trad Catholics, for example, they might be hostile to us nowadays. You just saw one of our bros here. Who was it? Duke of Earl, right? Three years ago, right? He would have been a hostile, right? He would have been an insurgent. He would have been a, he would have been a hostile. And now he says, hey, you hit me upside the head with that Palamos. And three years later, he's becoming Orthodox. So remember, a lot of these guys who are mad at us right now, Two, three, five years, they're going to be on our side. Watch. I, I guarantee you. And yes, we have to go through that kind of rough period where we have opposition, where we have disagreements. But it's all for the good down the road because I guarantee you, right? And we need to, that's what I'm saying is pray for these guys, right? We want to convert <clears throat> Matt Frag. We want to convert uh, Eric Ibarra. We want to convert Lofton. We want to convert all of them. And sometimes you gotta, you know, you gotta oppose people to get them down the road to convert. Again, a lot of people in the Discord, right? They used to hate us, and now they are our best allies. And so, uh, I'm not saying Jordan Peterson is some kind of like insurgent. That's just making a joke. I'm saying that the people that uh, we think might be against us now, in time, they're gonna come around, right? Francis, man, he just, he's a great apologist. All he does is <laughs> send people. To, so we just keep cheering on Pope Francis. He's going to be making more of these converts for us, right? These people are going to come around, pray for it, be optimistic. And people like Jordan Peterson, that's great. I hope that, and let's pray that Jordan Peterson becomes Orthodox. So don't get mad at these people. Don't get angry at these people. Um, if it's necessary, have, you know, the opposition when it's necessary uh, and pray for these people to uh, come over to our side and they will in time. They will. All right. I hope everybody enjoyed it. Uh, like, and share. And uh, next up we will be doing what's next part two. Oh, to, uh, tonight I'll be on with Ralph. We're going to be talking about the mafia and all that information. He happens to have a interest in that topic. I don't know if we'll be, we, we may talk about serial killers too. I don't know. We'll see what, what Ralph wants to talk about. So I'll be on with that tonight. And then um, uh, Father Deacon and I, and uh, one of his uh, buddies, it's an Orthodox guy with a PhD, Dr. Sean. Dr. Sean will be joining us in a few days to discuss some of his, super well-read, super, super smart dude. Um, great guy. I got to meet and hang out with him at the conference a couple weeks ago. <clears throat> So we're having a good interview with Dr. Sean. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what topics we'll be talking about. Maybe metaphysics and philosophy of science. I think is what we're going to talk about. Uh, that kind of stuff. But he's very Renaissance man. He could talk about all kinds of stuff. 
So he, he's going to be a good ally as well to have these kind of high quality conversations with um, bringing more big guns right to the to the table to the content. And then I'll be also be doing the part two of the serial killers and the part two of the mob movies. So Jamie and I still got to do that part two mafia movie where we do uh, Goodfellas and whatnot. So anyway, that's what's coming up this week. Hope you guys enjoy. Also, my talk with Gospel Simplicity should probably be up in the next week. He didn't give an exact date. I think he just uh, proposed to his fiance or his wife or girlfriend or whatever. Excuse me, his girlfriend. He just proposed. Well, if he proposed to his wife, that would be odd, right? Um, so he's been busy with planning, I guess, marriage and all that. So, but our show will be up. It'll be about theosis. Uh, if you didn't see his talk with Dr. Bradshaw, it was excellent. Really good uh, one-hour breakdown, and, and our talk, I think, came out.